The explanation accompanying figure 3 of facsimile 1 of the Book of Abraham identifies it as the idolatrous priest of Elkanah attempting to offer up Abraham as a sacrifice. In order to gauge the validity of this interpretation from an Egyptological perspective, a number of considerations need to be taken into account. The first issue to resolve is the matter of the lacunae or missing pieces in the original papyrus fragment. As printed in the March 1st, 1842 issue of the Times and Seasons, figure 3 is shown as a standing figure with a bald head and a drawn knife. In the original papyrus fragment, however, the areas with the bald head and knife are currently missing. At some unknown point, by some unknown person, an attempt was made to fill in the missing head of figure 3, although no such attempt was made in whatever is missing in the figure's hand. Determining whether the figure in the original papyrus is actually represented in facsimile 1 is important, as it may affect the interpretation of the figure. First, there is the question as to whether the knife being held by figure 3 could plausibly have been in the original vignette or illustration. The existence of the knife has been doubted by many because it does not conform to what other Egyptian papyri would lead us to expect, and so some Egyptologists have denied the possibility that the knife was original to this illustration, even if others have had no objection to the possibility. At least two different 19th century eyewitnesses who examined the papyri, including one who was not a Latter-day Saint, however, reported seeing a priest with a knife in his hand or a man standing by him with a drawn knife. The significance of this is that the presence of a knife in the original papyrus has here been described by a non-Mormon eyewitness whose description of the storage and preservation of the papyri matches that of independent contemporary accounts. It also matches the description another witness made before Reuben Headlock made the woodcuts of the facsimiles. This gives us two independent eyewitnesses to the presence of a knife on facsimile 1, regardless of what we might otherwise think. As such, despite our con unconscious or even conscious assumptions about what we think should be on the original papyrus, it is not valid to argue that something does not exist because it does not con correspond to what we expect. Furthermore, the crescent shape of the knife in figure 3's hand is consistent with the shape of ancient Egyptian flint knives, which were used from prehistoric times to the Middle Kingdom and thus Abraham's day, in, among other activities, ritual slaughter and execration rites. This reinforces the likelihood that the knife was original to the scene. Second, there is a question of whether figure 3 originally had a bald human head, as depicted in facsimile 1, or a black jackal headdress, as proposed by a number of Egyptologists. That the figure originally had a jackal headdress seems likely, since traces of the headdress over the left shoulder a figure 3 can be detected in the surviving papyrus fragment. With these considerations in mind, the question of identifying figure 3 comes into play. Some Egyptologists have identified this figure as a priest, while others have insisted it is the god Anubis. That the figure is Anubis seems plausible on account of the black coloring of the skin and the faint remaining traces of the jackal headdress over the figure's left shoulder. However, without a hieroglyphic caption for this figure, this identification should be accepted cautiously, as Anubis is not the only jackal-headed black-skinned figure attested in Egyptian iconography. What's more, the question as to whether the figure is a priest or the god Anubis, or another jackal-headed god, or whether it originally had a bald human head or jackal head, this appears to be a false dichotomy. The practice of masking for ritual and ceremonial purposes seems to have been important in Egypt from the earliest times and continued to be an element of ritual practice into the Roman period, and priestly impersonators of Anubis regularly appear in funerary ceremonies and are styled simply Inpu, Anubis, or Rimet Inpu, Anubis Men, or Ink Inpu, I am Anubis. At the non-funerary Hathor Temple of Deir el Medina is a depiction of a ritual taken from chapter 125 of the Book of the Dead, 
which shows the king offering incense and a priest masked as Anubis beating a round frame drum. Similarly, frescoes at the side of Her Herculaneum depict companies of the cult of Isis as held in Italy in the first century CE. This ritual scene fe features a number of priests and priestesses, including one figure who has been variously uh, interpreted as the god Osiris or a priest dressed up as the god Bess and disguised with a mask. Although the Heracul Heraculaneum dancer probably represents a masked participant impersonating the god, the matter would have been theologically unimportant to the ancient viewers of the scene, since the priest masked as Bess performing the ritual would, for all intents and purposes, have assumed the identity of the god himself in that ritual capacity. The potential significance of this for facsimile 1 has been explained by Egyptologist John Gee. Quote, Assume for the sake of argument that the head of facsimile 1, figure 3, is correct. What are the implications of the figure being a bald man? Shaving was a common feature of initiation into the priesthood from the Old Kingdom through the Roman period. Since complete shaving of the head was another mark of the male Isaiac votary and priest. The bald figure would then be a priest. Assume on the other hand that the head of facsimile 1 figure 3 is that of a jackal. We have representations of priests wearing masks. One example of an actual mask, literary, literary accounts from non-Egyptians and Egyptian priests wearing masks, and even a hitherto unrecognized Egyptian account of when a priest would wear a mask. In the midst of the embalmment ritual, a new section is introduced with the following passage. Afterwards, Anubis, the Stolite priest, wearing the head of his god, sits down and no lector priest shall approach him to bind the Stolites with any work. Thus, this text, thus, this text settles any questions about whether masks were actually used. It furthermore identifies the individual wearing the mask as a priest Thus, however the restoration is made, the individual shown in facsimile 1 figure 3 is a priest, and the entire question of which head should be on the figure is moot so far as identifying the figure is concerned. The entire debate has been a waste of ink, end of quote. The leopard skin robe worn by figure 3 would also be consistent with identifying this figure as a priest, specifically a class called the Sem priest, who is recognizable by his leopard skin robe and certain hairstyles. Interestingly, and perhaps significantly for Joseph Smith's interpretation of facsimile 1, the ritual clothing of the Sem priest had a clear connection to the god Anubis defeating chaos and evil, personified as the god Set, through violence. Papyrus Juli Jumilhak, dating to the Ptolemaic period, uh, attempts to explain the significance of the leopard skin through a myth that relates the misdeeds of the god Seth, as told in the papyrus. Seth attacked Osiris and then transformed himself into a leopard. The god Anubis defeated Seth and then branded his pelt with spots. Hence, the robe commemorates the defeat of Seth. Also in Papyrus Jumilhak, Anubis transforms himself into a giant snake and brandishes two flint knives. Even if some issues concerning the accuracy of both the artwork and the copying of facsimile 1 remain unanswered at the moment, issues which unfortunately are routinely clouded by shifting the responsibility of the artwork from the engraver Reuben Headlock to Joseph Smith without adducing any evidence to identify a particular individual with the responsibility for the restorations, the identification of this figure as a priest is not outside the realm of possibility from an Egyptological perspective.